back everybody to Valley Baptist University. This is our second session on mental health issues in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, our guest today is Dr. Alan Gates, who has been a therapist in the clinical world for 50 years. And I have been a pastor for 50 years. So we're giving you 100 years of something. Hopefully it's good <laughs> stuff. But anyway, Alan is one of my dear friends. We've known each other. I really can't remember a time when I didn't know Alan mm. and had the privilege of seeing you come to know Jesus. That's right. You Pastor, led me to Christ. Pastor Roger too. Pastor yes, Roger's Roger. Yes, and Roger came in my house one night, late at night, came in through my bedroom window. In the middle of the night. And led me to Christ. And remember we were teenagers then. We were very young then. <laughs> we, did, we didn't know any better. No, that's but, true. You know, the thing that's blessed me through the years is that you accepted Christ in your bedroom in the middle of the night and you've never looked back. Yep. You know, you, you followed him. And now here we are, gray-headed and 50 years later. But what we're talking about is mental health issues in the church. Yes. And mm. a couple of theme verses from the scripture, because we want to provide a clinical perspective yes. and a biblical perspective. And today's presentation is hopefully going to be very practical for people. Good. How we can, one, two, three, minister to people who are having these problems. But the scripture has a lot to say about this. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse number 2, the Apostle Paul very succinctly says that we are to bear one another's burdens. Mm. Literally, it means we are to carry each other's loads. Wow. And I've also thought about the Apostle Paul's um, teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he mm -hmm. said, we, if one member of the body, this is, he's talking about the body of Christ, how we're all, how the parts fit into a whole. Mm -hmm. He said, if one member um, of the body suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members are to rejoice with it. So we want to talk a little bit today about how to do that. Good. How can we carry someone's load who's struggling with mental health issues? And you gave a stat in our last session that was... Uh, staggering to me. You said within the church, there were how many, what percent are? 26 out of 100 people have some form of diagno diagnosed or diagnosable yeah. mental illness. So, you know, one in four. That's true. You take a congregation like Valley Baptist Church on any given Sunday, we're going to have between 4,000 and 5,000 people. That's hundreds of people. Right. But see, Phil, people think of mental illness as paranoid schizophrenia and, and people are going to think, well, no, we don't have any paranoid schizophrenics running around Valley Baptist. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about disorders like depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress syndrome and bipolar. And it's all on a spectrum, Phil. Mm -hmm. So people... But what, we, what we've done in our churches is we've had those brothers and sisters suffer in silence because we don't know how to help them. Mm. Well, can you give us... You, 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 uh, one of the things that's always impressive about you, Alan, is you could take a big, complex idea and put it down into very simple terms, almost a one, two, three, four step to, to, to do. That It's something we can put in our pocket and carry it out of here and, and, and keep it in our mind. Share with us some of the ways we can carry other people's loads. Excellent. So, Phil, what we want to be able to help each Christian in our church be able to recognize uh, someone with a mental illness and help them and do something that's helpful. So if we will do three things, Phil. One is if we'll just be there to listen. Sometimes listening is the solution. Hmm. And so when we listen to other people, and I, I've heard you say a number of times, it's the pre ministry of presence. Exactly. Right? It just listening and just being available and, and, and just being there for people. It is a powerful concept to listen to one another. The second thing we can do, Phil, is we need to do things practical. We need to, to, do, to help people practically uh, uh, with their particular issues, like help them get to doctor's appointments, help them with their medications, help them with counseling, making sure that we're just helping people. What we don't want to do with people is to say, just call me if you ever need me. Because we know they're, they're not, not going to call me. <laughs> they're not going to call me, yeah. right? But if we say to people, is there anything I can do for you today? 
That's the helpful piece. Mm -hmm. We need to listen. We need to do something helpful. And third, Phil, the most difficult piece is walk people, walk with people through their traumas. Mm. It's a very difficult thing to do. Well, let's talk about that just for a minute. Okay. W walking people through their traumas. Um, that sounds to me like carrying that load. So in all of these steps that we're going to take to help carry the load. Listening and... and um, uh, doing something doing helpful. something helpful and walking with people. Much of that is just being in their presence. Mm. Psalm 23, I think, speaks to that very issue in a real way. Th that's the most famous chapter in the entire Bible. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But right in the heart of that, he addresses the fearful issue of death. And who doesn't fear death? Right. Even a preacher fears death. Right. But he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. You're with me. So the presence of the Lord is what gave him the confidence to face death. And we can be Christ-like in that way. Mm -hmm. When we come alongside someone and we're there with them. Mm -hmm. Now, just a little technical issue, and it's just the preacher in me, not the, not the clinical psychologist like you are. But recently I read a fellow who carefully studied Psalm 23 and David literally put that phrase, three Hebrew words, right in the heart of Psalm 23. Hmm. When I mean heart, I mean the direct center. 26 words precede that phrase and 26 words follow it. So David was trying to say one big idea in Psalm 23, the Lord is with me. Yeah. I remember our, our good friend, Roger Spratt, and we grew up together. Uh, he was there the moment you accepted Christ. Yeah. Uh, he suffered uh, from a aggressive cancer and lived mm -hmm. for about a year mm -hmm. and he just died a few months ago yes in the midst of that roger said something to the congregation that it, it really struck me he said i've discovered something more precious than god's promises and that's god's presence mm. and i thought there's a man who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death and knows what he's talking about yeah this is what you're talking about too right we we have that capability to be present right and what we know about God is God can heal any illness, right? But sometimes God chooses not to heal illnesses, in Roger's case, no. in the way that we prayerfully want him to and seeking God. And I know the whole congregation was praying for, for Roger's health and mm -hmm. literally people all over the United States mm -hmm. were praying for Roger. All over the world. All over the world, yeah. So God doesn't heal maybe in the ways that we want him to. And particularly with mental illness, Phil, um, it's, it, you don't just go to a therapist or go to a psychiatrist or take a particular pill and then that heals you. It's a process that has to happen. Now God can choose to heal people with depression or anxiety or bipolar or whatever, but um, it's not usually the process that happens. It's an ongoing journey of suffering. And so that's why we need to be able to walk with people in their journey of suffering. Now, um, the journey of suffering, that's a good turn of a phrase. Uh, one of the ways here at Valley Baptist Church that we try to accomplish that. Okay. If you come into the big congregation and you sit amongst 2,000 people, uh, you can suffer in silence, as you said the other day. That's right. You can come right in, walk right out, and no one says anything to you. Right. What we try to do here is emphasize, and we do this over and over and over again, and we think it's biblical, is to be a part of a small group. Okay. And so at our church, some of the things we've done is provided small groups like, and these are programs that are nationally known, but we've plugged into them, like Grief Share, Celebrate Recovery, Divorce Care. Is it important? Maybe can we encourage people and carry their load by making sure they're a part of a small group? Sure, because we don't want people to suffer in silence. Yeah. You know, people are struggling. And you know, when people are struggling, I say, that's good. They're like, what kind of therapist are you? But struggling is a part of life. And to deny that, to deny that life is difficult is irrational. Explain that's what irrational you mean, thinking. struggling is good. Okay. That sounds like an oxymoron. <laughs> yes. Struggling is good because you know what the opposite of struggling is? Giving up. 
Ah. And so when people give up, that's when they fall into their disorder farther and farther and farther or into their trauma or into their PTSD. So we want people to struggle, meaning that they're looking to, to be able to manage their disorder. And as they struggle and as we're struggling with them, we become sensitive to them. We become mm. sensitive to what God can do. You know, again, God can heal any illness, but, and that's the struggle that we have in the church about mental illness is because God can heal and yet God doesn't always heal people. Mm. So we want to help people not to struggle in silence. We don't want to define people as their mental illness. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had an interesting conversation with Cindy Neighbors. You happen to know who she is. Yeah. It's your wife. Yes. And Cindy said something really important to me. She said, uh, depression doesn't define me as a person. It's a part of who I am, but it's not all of who I am. And I thought that was incredibly brilliant on her part to be able, as she ministers to women mm -hmm. here at Valley Baptist, mm -hmm. to see that in people's lives. She said, you know, Alan, if you have a heart problem, it's not there's Alan with a heart problem. It's Alan. It's mm -hmm. who I am different mm -hmm. than my disorder, whatever my disorder happens to be. You know, Alan, when I hear you talk, it reminds me that in Scripture and even in history, we find that some of the most spiritual people that we can define or identify, they also struggle with difficulties. Mm. I mean, I think about King David in the Old Testament. I mean, he wrote for us the book of Psalms. And if you listen to the Psalms, he's often talking about stress, anxiety, fear, disorientation. Uh, he writes two Psalms that simply say, why are you cast down on my soul? Wow. Like he's talking to himself, yeah. why are you depressed? What is this problem? Mm -hmm. And David was transparent in those Psalms. And I, do you think it's a good idea to help people who struggle with those issues to help them say, this is a place in Scripture you can find help in the Psalms? Oh, I think so. I think that um, reading the Psalms and understanding the Psalms and just processing helps us feel like we're not alone, Phil, that we... Uh, that God has something to say to us, even though we have depression or we have anxiety, and it's not a faith issue. It becomes not a faith issue for me, or I could just pray through it and everything's going to change. Because my serotonin level and my faith don't have anything in common. Mm -hmm. If my brain works or it doesn't, it's the same in counseling. Unless a person can think rationally, unless we can uh, help them with medications, help them with their brains working correctly, there's not anything I can do for them in counseling. Mm. You know, I even think about the Lord Jesus. Uh, he delivered his first sermon in Luke chapter 4 in Luke's account. So if you, if you read the Gospel of Luke and in volume 2, the book of Acts, you have from the birth of Christ to the imprisonment of the Apostle Paul, this mm. sacred history yeah. uh, that is so important. If you look at that, if you just lift it out of scriptures and look at it, and you say, okay, where's the first time Luke tells us anything that Jesus said? Hmm. It's Luke chapter 4. Huh. And it's a sermon that Jesus delivered to his hometown of Nazareth. And listen to who he was addressing. He said, I am speaking to those who are poor, to those who are brokenhearted, mm. to those who are captive or addicted or bound, yep. to those who are oppressed. I think maybe the Lord Jesus knew something about this. I think he did. And he addressed that right in his initial sermon. He said, basically, this is my audience. Mm. These are the ones who will receive my word. These that struggle with those kinds of problems. Uh, so, Isn't it wonderful to know that we have a God that understands our brain disorders, our emotional state, our physical problems, our medical problems, mm -hmm. a God that understands all of that. You know, couple, another thing that you have said to me before is we have a whole book in the Bible written about uh, depression and anxiety called Lamentations. That's right. That's right. one of the titles of the book. Yeah. Is that, and, and, a, and a great deal of the psalms are what we call lament psalms, where the psalmist, David, whoever, one of the priests, Asaph, sons of Asaph and Korah, where they find themselves in a terrible situation. They don't understand what's going on. And they're disoriented. Mm. And they lament. 
-hmm. but often they turn. So let's wrap this up and see if we can't have some practical application here right at the end to add to what we've already said practically. And one of the things I think I've heard you say today is if you're a believer and you're struggling with some kind of mental disorder, you're not alone. That's great. You're not alone. Yeah. It is real. Yes. And it's very prominent. Uh, you know, one of my favorite preachers was Charles Spurgeon. Mm. And many people may not know the story. I've studied his life extensively. Is that he would really suffer with depression. Yeah. And it was almost seasonal for him. Yeah. Uh, London is, gets in the fog in the winter. Yeah. And it got so bad in the, towards the last third of Spurgeon's life, he would leave London for three months mm. and go to the French Riviera. I now know today it probably wasn't like that back then. But right. today... It, and he would bask in the sun and recharge his batteries and come back and be a powerful leader. And we have a psychological term for that, what? seasonal depression disorder. Really? Yes. I did not know that that existed. That exists. Well, I guess Spurgeon um, suffered from that. Second, I think would be, as I listen to you talk, God sees you as you are. Mm. Just Very as important. I am, as Billy Graham Just said. Just as I am, that's right. And then last of all, and this is where my heartbeat is as a pastor, is that God's Word speaks to this. Yes. And God's Word can speak. I always like to say in prayer, we speak to God. In His written revelation of His Word, God speaks to me. It's good. So as difficult as it may be for someone who's struggling with these issues, maybe one of the best things we can do is say God's Word says this. Alan, let me ask you, we, we've talked a lot of practical things you shared with us you know, the three steps that we could do. What is something that we should not do? <laughs> we, the positive, but sometimes as believers, maybe we do the wrong thing. Sure. We shouldn't um, see people as crazy or acting out or trying to get attention. Mm -hmm. So, and we, and, and we tend to think in phrases like this, they need to suck it up. They need to get over it. Mm. They need to just stop acting out. They need to stop acting crazy. They need to stop trying to get attention. That's not what happens with a person that's got a mental disorder. Mm. They ha we have to remember this is a brain disorder, that they need uh, uh, several things to help them through the process. It is a journey that they're on. There's not going to be a quick fix. There's not going to be something that happens that just dramatically changes them. Now, can God intervene? Of course. Can God create a miracle? Of course. Does he choose to do that often? No. Let me ask you this. When you talk about someone that's really suffering from maybe a disabling mental disorder, what can the caregiver do? I, it's, uh, and we've already probably do what we've already said in these ideas, how they could do it, but is there anything specifically that you found that could help with a caregiver's role in a sure. mental health issue? A couple things. One is you need to form a support group. You need to be involved in a support group yeah. with other people that are experiencing the same things that you are as a caregiver. So you can get support, help, um, uh, practicality, clarification of, of issues so that you can uh, have other people to walk with you. As we said, uh, God doesn't, uh, doesn't want you to be alone. Secondly is self-care. Very important that a person pay attention to themselves. The, mm -hmm. the word pay attention. Not only pay attention to others, but pay attention to themselves. And there are four areas that I like to talk to people about paying attention. And I use the word person. P-E-R-S-O-N. P stands for physical. Making sure you're taking care of your physical health. That means sleep, vitamins, water, eating correctly. Those are the f pillars of the physical life. E is emotion in the word person. Emotional life. Making sure that you're doing things uh, that are creating pleasure for yourself because it's painful walking through and messy walking through someone with, that has a mental illness that's in your family or in, in your surroundings. So P is physical, E is emotional, R is relational, developing those support groups. Mm -hmm. S is spiritual, making sure you're staying in the Word of God, making sure you're involved with, the, with people of God. P-E-R-S. Oh, you want to know what O on is? What is O? Get on with it. Get on o with it. Ah. Is to make sure that you're getting on with it on a daily basis, mm. that you're taking care of yourself 
on a daily basis. Let me ask you this. If a person is listening to us today and they're struggling in silence, as you said, although yes. there was a powerful way to describe an experience of someone who's suffering mental disorder, mm -hmm. uh, help someone understand that it's okay to call, ask for help. Yeah. And even professional help. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Uh, again, scripture and medication are not enemies. Therapy and, and uh, problems are not enemies. We need to, you need to make sure, however, that you understand the therapeutic approach of the therapist or the psychiatrist or the physician that you're seeing so that they validate your faith instead of making fun of it or insult your faith. Now, Valley Baptist has created a large community of support systems. Mm -hmm. And so being able to look at the website on Valley or finding someone who's involved in a leadership role in one of the support systems of Valley and going to them and asking for help, that can be a tremendous opportunity. Not only for us as a church to minister to people and help them restore their lives, but also doing what, the, what Christ has commanded us to do. So once again, we come back to that very prominent theme of the New Testament, that the Lord Jesus designed our Christian experience to be in community. Mm. And that can even help us psychologically. Absolutely. As well as spiritually. Absolutely. Alan, I've heard you say several times that people who struggle with mental health issues, mm -hmm. they often suffer in silence. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, it means that we're scared to talk about our mental illness inside the church walls because we want people to think that we're all right, yeah. that we don't have any problems, that because we're a Christian, uh, we don't want people to think that we have a lack of faith or that we're not praying or that we're not reading our Bibles. And, but we have to understand a brain disorder, a brain illness is not a, a lack of faith a lack of praying, or a lack of reading our Bible. So there are times that there are spiritual issues that are, that are absolutely not mental health issues, that we need the help of our pastors or, or, or of our church leadership. And then there are times that we need to be getting medication, that we need to be able to uh, see a therapist. So it's very different at sorting those things out. Alan, I think sometimes as Christians, we may think that it's a lack of faith if we need medication yeah. for our emotional stress and disorders. I think there's some inhibitions that many of us have mm -hmm. about, I'm not a good person if I have to get on medication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. You're saying. That I'm weak or I'm mm -hmm. stupid mm -hmm. or uh, I'm out of control. I'm out of control. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's your brain. It's a brain disorder that we're talking about. And that we sometimes need chemicals inside our brain because we didn't get everything that we needed we were, we were born or the traumas that we've experienced have changed our brain chemistry to the point that we don't think rational. And so what happens is, as our brain uh, doesn't think rational, is we develop all kinds of behavioral problems to try to cope with the fact that we know that we're not rational. And some of those behavioral problems create all kinds of problems with ourselves, with our physical body, with our emotions, and with people around us. Mm. Now let me ask you this. You said trauma could potentially change your brain chemistry? Absolutely. If you go, could you explain that? Sure. Just a little bit. Sure. If you were, uh, and I'm gonna use this illustration. If you were sexually molested and you're a girl from age two to five, do you think that that would change your brain chemistry the rest of your life? Mm. If you experienced uh, 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 the death of somebody that you're in a car wreck with, do you think that that would change your brain chemistry? Mm. So it's all of those kinds of traumas that can happen that will change our brain chemistry and sometimes um, we just need other chemicals in our brain to help us think rationally. If a person doesn't think rationally, there's nothing I can do for them in a counseling setting. There's nothing that they can pray through. There's nothing that they can read that's going to be helpful to them. You know, Alan, when I hear you talk about the brain chemistry, yes, you, how many neurons or what was the word you 800 used? 800 billion neurons in our brain. So what you're saying is 
the mind is very complex. Incredibly complex. And that, I guess, is the seat of the emotion or the heart, however we want to define mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But I guess one medication doesn't fit all, does it? No, it doesn't. Matter of fact, one of the struggles that we have as caregivers or professionals and, and patients or clients themselves is that the medications are, we call it practice. We try to figure out mm -hmm. what medications work right. the best. And people are individuals, right? Your body chemistry is different. Your brain chemistry is different than other people. Again, 800 billion neurons, there's going to be a lot of different uh, combinations that can happen. So times in people's lives, antidepressants work real well, a particular kind of antidepressant, and they wake up one morning, the antidepressant doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, your brain chemistry has changed, or the food that you've eat that you're eating mm -hmm. changes your body chemistry, or the more trauma that you experience, or a relationship, or things that are even good that happen to mm -hmm. you can change your brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. So medications, we're constantly looking to try to change those to, to make sure that we're doing the most helpful thing that we can for people. So Phil, we've been talking about mental illness from a clinical perspective. And that's one half of the issue. Biblical perspective is very important here as we understand the whole person. Can you give me an example or two from the Bible of people that suffered uh, depression or anxiety? Well, yes. Uh, and I think sometimes when we read the Bible and we read a Bible story about a Bible character, it's easy for us to romanticize that about that figure and we elevate them to this spiritual status that they were like their feet never touched the ground. Mm. But if you read the stories carefully, the scripture is extremely transparent. It, it doesn't cover up sin mm. and it doesn't cover up problems and sorrows and heartaches. Uh, I mean, just one quick example off the top of my head would be the great prophet Jeremiah. Mm, yeah. uh, if you read about Jeremiah's experience, so as you read Jeremiah, you hear his message. He had sermons. That's what it was. They were recorded sermons. But in between the sermons, there's the storyline of Jeremiah's life and what he was facing. And at one point in Jeremiah's life, he begged God to take him. Mm. Suicide. He, he had suicidal tendencies. He did. Jonah had suicidal tendencies. Yeah. Elijah. Elijah. Had, had suicidal yeah. tendencies. Yeah. Even Moses struggled with that. The great Moses. So yes, the saints of old struggled with these kinds of issues. So these aren't new issues. Depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. Mm. These are not new issues. King Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Well, I think those are some good things that all of us can learn about mental health issues in the church. And uh, those first three big ideas that you gave us, let's reiterate those um, that you walked through a moment ago is listening, listening, do something practical or helpful, do something practical or helpful, and be willing to walk through the person's pain and mm. suffering with them. Years ago, I heard an old preacher say he was a great preacher and he had great sermons and great illustrations. And someone asked him in a conference and he would say, where do you get all these great ideas? And he said, I pay attention. I pay attention. What he meant by that, I think, was I'm always on the look. Mm. Maybe that's what we need to do when we come to church on Sunday is let's pay attention to those around us because someone might be in need of someone just saying, let me help you with your love. That's great. Thanks for being with us today, Alan. I think you've helped me. You've helped all of us. And I pray this has been a blessing to you as well.